Hi folks. Well, guess what? We've reached that point in the semester where it's time for us to learn your favorite and mine sociological theory. All right, I know it's probably not your favorite. It is my favorite, but for most students, this does tend to be the most challenging material in the textbook in the semester. And so I have purposefully put it at the end of the semester, hoping that as you've been exposed to material throughout this semester in your textbook and in your lessons, that this material makes more sense to you and is easier for you to apply. So the first thing we really have to know is exactly what is a theory? Well, a theory is a prediction or an assumption. It's a beginning phase for research and it's a way for sociologists to explain how groups are interacting with each other, how people are interacting with each other, and it also helps us to create testable propositions about society. Remember those hypotheses. We talked about the hypothesis in terms of an if-then statement. Our theory lets us ruminate in our brain about how we want to move forward with our variables and our hypothesis. So as in any other scientific discipline, remember sociology is a science, all sociological research begins with theory. It begins with us thinking about things in a particular set of ways, which is what theory lets us do. It's kind of like the playbook that we do research by. For example, if you happen to be an athlete, you have a playbook. You know that there is a particular way that your team approaches your sport. That's what theory does for sociologists when they do research. It gives us a way to approach our research. Now, in a lot of other sciences, you only have one overarching theory that guides your research. And I'll give you an example here. For a physicist, you have the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory guides your research. It sets a foundation for how you do future research. And so it's easy in some other sciences because there is that one big overarching theory that everybody agrees on is the way things begin. Well, sociology can't be that easy, of course not. We have multiple competing theories that we have to know well enough to know which one is going to be the best fit for a particular research project. And this can be confusing when you first start out doing research. Part of that is knowing your levels of analysis. Part of it is knowing the kinds of designs and methods that you want to do with your research. It all kind of has to click into place. And one of the things you can do when you first start doing sociological research is rely on other more experienced sociologists. You know this isn't the first time I've said that. So it becomes your job when you decide to do research to know which theory you're going to use or apply and how and when to apply it in your research. For purposes of this class, I'm going to hold you to learning three or four major theories these are going to show up on your tests, but I want you to know this. On any given day, there are probably hundreds of sociological theories out there in use in the research field worldwide. But the interesting thing is that all of the theories that we use find their beginnings in these three or four major theoretical perspectives. And you'll see why I'm saying three or four as we move through these theories. Now, remember, we talked about level of analysis, meaning macro level or micro level. And once we figured out what level of analysis we're going to be at, that helps us to narrow down our theories. And you really can then select just from a handful of theories. And you do this by experience and practice. You do it by discussing again with other researchers. You do it by reading prior research, which is also called a literature review. The worst thing you can do as a researcher is figure out a research problem and write up a proposal to start that research and realize that you didn't do a thorough enough literature review and somebody else has already done that. You don't want to repeat 
needless research. If someone else has already researched something and come up with a good conclusion or relationship, then you may not need to do it. This is why we're always, as professors, harping on our students, did you do a literature review? Because you have to know what's already out there about your topic before you can proceed to do what you think is original research. All right, so you've either figured out, am I at the macro level or am I at the micro level with this project? And that helps you to further narrow down. Now. In the field of sociology, there are particular components that we have to look for within our theories. As I have said, all sociological theories help to explain human events and behavior, how we interact with each other, how we interact with the structure. But further than that, all sociological theories have to address two key questions. And remember before I did hint to you that there is actually a third level of analysis called the meso level. Well, with just a handful of exceptions, every sociological theory we have is going to fit into either the macro or the micro. There are very few that really reside in that meso level. So what exactly are these questions that all sociological theories have to address? Well, the first is, how do we exist? What is it that binds us together? What are the components that are like the glue that keeps us together as groups or communities, as societies, as nations, and so on? The second key question, how do we change? If things aren't working well, if we start to find that we're having some ripples in the fabric of society, then what is the mechanism that changes us. So every theory has to address these questions in a different way. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to have competing theories. Really important questions, folks. The first question a theory must address, how do we exist? The second question a theory must address, how do we change? Now we're going to talk about our theories chronologically. We're going to talk about from the very first theory that came on the scene all the way through. The first theory that was important in the field of sociology is called functionalism. And now today you will also hear this theory called structural functionalism. And this was the first sociological theory and goes all the way back to Auguste Comte, Emile Durkheim, those original French sociologists. And I like to think about this theory as the following. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it breaks, don't do anything. It'll work itself out. Now I want you to think about the time period here because we're talking about the 1800s. And I want you to think about what was going on in the West at that time. Remember Charles Darwin was a big hitter and he had his own ideas about how things happened in the world, right? Survival of the fittest, the theory of evolution, whatever you want to call it is fine. But he was very popular. And a lot of those original sociologists also thought about society in the same way. Society is like an organism and it will adapt. The people in it will adapt. And we don't really have to do anything to make those adaptions take place. So think about this like a single cell. There are certain parts of a cell that are considered essential to the cell's survival. The membrane, the nucleus, the Golgi bodies, and so forth and so on. If a piece of the cell doesn't work right, then the cell dies or it becomes diseased. If we think about society in the same way, and instead of thinking about these components as components of a cell, we think about them as components of society, this theory is very close to that idea. And so perhaps we're talking about a piece of that social cell being the government or a piece of it being education, or a piece of it being the family, or a piece of it being your peer groups or the media. All of those pieces of society have to work well in order for society to exist. And you don't have to do anything to make that happen. It happens on its own when the cell is working right. So if you think about it in those terms, this theory is saying to us that society exists in a state of balance, if you will. 
So the focus of functional theory is macro level, meaning it's looking at those structural components and taking a big picture to small picture point of view. And the answer to that first question, how does society exist? Well, if we think about that cell, it must be stable or harmonious. You know, the words that you hear used in biology class, homeostasis, equilibrium, all of those words fit this theory to the answer of that first key question. How do we exist? We have to work together. How does society change? That second question? Well, again, remember I told you Darwin was pretty popular in this period of time. So the process by which society changes, we'll call it evolution, right? There is pressure on individuals by the social structure. No one's really doing anything to make that change happen. But what that pressure does is it keeps us conforming. So in this theory, if society is having problems, we let laws and sanctions and mores and standards work. When they work, they will fix the problem. We don't have to actually, as groups of people, actively intervene to make that work happen. We have laws in place. And this is a little bit of a problem for us because we do know that there are times in our society where people actually have to take an active role in changing the structure. So that is the biggest criticism here. If we're just gonna let things evolve on some path that doesn't really mean we have to do anything, then what do we do if something really does go bad? There's no space here for human intervention. Another thing to consider when we're talking about functional theory or structural functionalism is the idea of manifest and latent functions. And this comes from Robert Merton, and he didn't actually develop this idea until the mid 1900s. But he said, you know, even if we're thinking about how the components of society are functioning, we should also recognize that those functions might be important for some people and they might be different for other people. And so he came up with this idea of manifest and latent functions. If we look at, for example, the function of dating, the manifest function of dating is mate selection. We date and rule out until we rule in. And when we rule in, for most of us, the end goal or the game is to get married. So the manifest function of dating is mate selection. Now, there are some other, let's call them added benefits that we can get when we're dating. And these are what we would call latent functions, the things that are happening that aren't really intended. Sexual activity, sexual experimentation, perhaps even just having somebody to go to the movies with on Friday night. All of these things are latent functions of dating. And Merton does go on even further to talk about the manifest and latent dysfunctions that could occur with particular social institutions or social structure. So that's just something for you to bear in mind as you move forward in sociology. Now, that theory was the first theory in the field of sociology and existed by itself for a while. And it was kind of the approach that all social researchers and theorists were taking to do their research. How are all of these institutional forces, these big structural elements impacting people until somebody kind of said, hold on a second, it can't always be so rosy. We can't just be bumbling along in the world and expect that things are gonna work out well for most of us and expect that society is just gonna keep itself somehow magically balanced. No, this theorist is Karl Marx. And Karl Marx, among other conflict theorists, develop this perspective as a response to the problems that they saw with this hands-off attitude of the functional theorists. So this is the second theory, and it competes with functional theory. And I like to think about this one with the phrase, the one with the most toys wins. This particular theory is not based on balance or equilibrium being achieved, no. This one is based on unequal distribution and access to scarce social resources. 
this is where those haves and have nots come into play. Marx really is in a little bit of a panic in his lifetime because he sees capitalism as being detrimental to most people over time. He says, I don't see how this kind of system where some people control most of the wealth can work well for most people over time. And people didn't want to hear that in Marx's lifetime for the most part. He was not very popular. Nonetheless, he spent his life convinced that we really needed to work hard as groups of people who weren't getting their needs met. We really needed to work hard to overthrow the system of power so that we could make things in society more equitable. And this is the conflict perspective. Now, the conflict perspective is also a macro level perspective. It's talking about those big structural elements, working from big to small. And here are the answers to the key questions. This one, rather than saying society exists in a balanced and harmonious state, it says that society exists at levels of inequality or stratification, some groups with more power than others, some groups with more control than others. And this causes unrest. And when that happens, the answer to the second key question, society changes not by evolution, but by revolution. And that revolution is called the dialectic process. What? Okay, so here's the dialectic process. Now, this is not Marx's original work, and Marx never really called any of what he was doing the dialectic process, but you can see this coming through in conflict perspective. Conflict perspective says we are at some place in society. This is where we are today. And certain groups in society are having their needs met while others are not. And the farther apart those groups get, the more upset the group whose needs aren't getting met will be. And eventually what will happen is they will band together and attempt to overthrow the group with power. So in this particular equation, the thesis is our starting point. It's where we are. The antithesis is that group that gets angry, their needs aren't getting met, and they come back to clash with the status quo. Now, Marx would have called this a bloody revolution, and he saw this as a temporary state. And I want you to think back to when we were talking about the French Revolution, because that is a good example of what Marx would have said changes society, that kind of process of people's needs not being met. So they clash with the status quo, the people in power, and when they do, a synthesis will be obtained. What is that synthesis? Well, it's a new place. It means that the people who were in power have had to give some up, and the people who weren't in power have gotten some. And after that crisis or that revolution takes place, society becomes a better place for most people. Now, it's important to note that this is a process, meaning that once we reach that synthesis, that new place in society, we start the process again, because eventually what's going to happen? One group or more groups are going to be disenfranchised. They're going to fight back against the status quo, and we're going to come to a new resolution there. So for this particular equation, remember, society exists in a state of inequality. That inequality is the struggle for those scarce social resources. And society changes by a process of revolution or the dialectic. Right, so here when society is having problems, people actually must intervene to make that change happen. And so you can see how it is completely opposed to functional theory. The criticism here, however, is where's the revolution, Marx? Here we are now a couple of hundred years on into heavy capitalism, and there hasn't really been a significant upheaval to change this system. And so that is one of the big drawbacks. Now, Marx's work in the United States 
was somewhat popular in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when we had the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and the beginnings of the GLBTQ movement. And then it kind of fell out of favor because we weren't experiencing a lot of turmoil in society, you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, that period. But it has experienced a bit of a revival of late. If you think about the Occupy Wall Street movement, if you think about the contemporary movement for LGBTQIA rights, these are good examples of how people have banded together to push back against the structure to try and change some of those things that they perceive to be unequal. So now these two theories, functionalism and conflict, were around for quite a long time competing with each other. And really the uses, theoretically, are quite different. If you want to try and identify the functions of a particular social institution or structure, of course you want to look at functional theory. If you want to try to identify some of the problems that are happening in society or some of that social upheaval, or social inequality, of course you want to use conflict theory. So you can see why it's important for us to have both of these theories. Now remember, I did say to you that they're both macro level theories, and this is a little bit of a problem because if you think about it, it doesn't allow for the individual to push the structure to change things at the micro level. And so along comes our third big social theory, and it's called interactionism, later named symbolic interactionism. So anytime you hear these words, we're talking about the same theory. And this theory comes along in the early 1900s as a response to the problems with everything being done at that macro level as far as sociological research was concerned. This particular theory stresses the role of the individual on the structure. And this is the third major sociological theory. We could look at this one in terms of what we would call perception is reality. This theory is the closest that we get to psychology, but it's still not psychology. Remember psychology, the focus is inside the head, those organic things that are happening that drive your behavior. Sociology is outside the head. All of those interactions that we're having with things around us and people around us that influence our behavior. But this is as close as we get because it brings things down to a micro level and it says that exchanges that we have with others and the meanings that we attach to those exchanges are what form society. Hmm. All right, we still have to answer those two key questions. Now, again, this is a micro theory, so we're looking at intimate relationships here, small groups, and how those very small groups influence the structure. So, how do we exist? Well, we can only exist if we can share meanings with each other. And those meanings, we can only share them if we develop some symbols to do so. Language is a symbol, right? So society exists when we share meanings with each other. That's what this theory says. And I kind of like that. It's very elegant, right? How do we change? We change when social meanings change. So let me give you an example of that. If I said this word to you, ginormous, what would I mean? Would I mean gigantic? Would I mean enormous? No, I would mean ginormous, otherwise we wouldn't need a new word. Ginormous, a combination of being gigantic and enormous, right? But we have a new word, so we have a new meaning, and this meaning is slightly different than anything else we had before. So in this particular theory, things in society change when our meanings start to change and develop in a different pattern. So we now share meanings about the word ginormous, and we can agree that it doesn't exactly mean gigantic, and it doesn't exactly mean enormous. It's its own word with its own meaning. So we can share that amongst each other. The first time we hear the word ginormous, maybe we don't know exactly what it means, but now it's become part of who we are to use this word. So interactionism, or 
Symbolic interaction theory says if society's having problems, we're misunderstanding each other. And really all we have to do is correct that by reinterpreting and gathering more information. Now from a macro level perspective, the big criticism of interaction theory is how much influence can a few people have? Well, I'll show you. Someone said that word first and when they said it, it took off. Let's see if I can actually do that. Let me give you a word that I have created and let's see if we can make it take off. Okay, here's my word, not Neanderthal, Meanderthal. And what I'm going to say the definition of Meanderthal is, is a person who's not paying any attention to where they're going, usually because they're looking at their cell phone. That's what I'm going to call a Meanderthal. Now let's see if that word catches on. You all go out and use it, tell people about it. I think it's a pretty good word. And we'll see if eventually it doesn't end up in the lexicon. And if it does, that's an example of symbolic interaction at work. All right, now you remember I said to you there are three slash four major theoretical perspectives. And this is the reason why feminist theory, and this is a very rare exception in the field of sociology because I'll call it a combo theory, it cannot stand alone. And really, it has to work in combination with either conflict theory or interaction theory. So really all it does is add the lens of gender to the sociological study, to that research project. If we are using a macro level conflict perspective and we want to examine things by the lens of gender, then we are using feminist theory at the macro level, but conflict is the answer to the two key questions. If we want to use feminist theory at the micro level, we are using interaction theory and adding the lens of gender. However, the answers to the two key questions are the same as they would be for symbolic interaction. So let me show you this on a chart to see if it becomes a little clearer for you. All right, if we're using feminist conflict or macro level perspective, the answer to the first question, how do we exist? We exist unequally because we have a gendered division of labor in society. So we have unequal access to social resources such as jobs, money, power, control, authority, all of those things. How do we change? We still change by the dialectic process. So there's no difference there when we're using feminist theory at the macro level in the answers to those two key questions except that for our particular research project, we're going to examine things through the lens of gender. Likewise, if we wanna bring it down to that intimate level, we're going to say we exist by gendered interaction and the use of gendered language and symbols and how that shapes the experiences of people in society. Let me give you a great example here. The use of the phrase, you guys, when you have a room of mixed gender people. Some people are okay with that. For other people, it just sticks in their craw. They don't like it. And so they'll speak up and they'll say, hey, I'm not a guy. And they'll ask the person to change the way they're addressing the group. Folks or people is more neutral than you guys. So you can see how those interactions might change the way that we greet groups of people over time. So those meanings, the change mechanism, are constantly being shaped and reshaped by people in the interactions they have on a day-to-day -day basis. I can go back to conflict theory too and give you a great example here of how we would use feminist perspective at that macro level. What about unequal pay for the same jobs? That's another example there at the macro level of how we would add the lens of gender to the study of the workplace. 
All right, so I hope this is a reasonable introduction for you to sociological theory, and I hope this does help you to understand the remainder of chapter one. Let me know, of course, if you have any questions at all by posting to your general discussion forum or by emailing me. Take care. Bye-bye.